and welcome to this May edition of the Cambridge Cafe Scientific podcast, sponsored by the Medical Research Council. I'm Mira Senthi Lingam from the Naked Scientists. Intelligence is something quite unique to us humans. Our ability to think, plan, problem solve, communicate, and learn, to name a few is what sets us apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. But the way in which the billions of neurons in our brain activate and control these abilities is still largely a mystery, and neuroscientists like Professor John Duncan are trying to solve this mystery and reveal just what intelligence is and how it actually happens. There are as many kinds of human intelligence as there are people thinking about it or defining it. We bring to the things that we do an enormous range of aptitudes, skills, abilities, personality characteristics and so on. But one of the things that's been of interest to psychology for over 100 years or so is a core ability to do many, many different types of thing well. And it is the sort of thing that's measured in standard intelligence tests. To some extent, it's predictive of how well people will do at school or in their jobs in all sorts of other things. And we are trying to look for a brain explanation for why this overall tendency to do many different things well would exist. So how are you focusing in on this? Uh, Well, there are many different parts of research which have come together, and this, in a way, is what makes the modern science of the brain so exciting in the 21st century. So some of it has to do with conventional intelligence testing, which I've said has been around for 100 years or more. Um, Some of it has to do with the study of brain damage and how people's behaviour is changed and perhaps their choices become less intelligent after damage to particular circuits within the brain. Some of it has to do with looking at how computers can be programmed to think like human beings, for example, when solving logical puzzles. Some of it has to do with neurophysiology and recording how the tiny neurons in the brain uh, respond as a person goes through a line of thought. Some of it has to do, as I say, with modern methods of brain imaging and being able to peer inside the skull and see what in the brain is, is working and how it's working as a person thinks. So it's by no means a simple topic, but you you started by mentioning that there's a a circuit you've identified, an intelligent circuit. So what is this, and and I guess where in the brain does it span? It's quite, quite local, but also quite distributed. So it's small regions in both the front of the brain, the frontal lobes, and a, and a corresponding region in the back of the brain, the parietal lobes. The main property of this circuit seems to be that cells within it have this remarkable ability to focus attention on the exact contents of current thinking. So that in many parts of the brain, a cell, for example, will respond in the visual system to a particular line in a particular part of the visual field, and that's what it does. It's a specialist. But in this frontal and parietal circuit, cells instead are generalists. Whatever you need to focus on, they seem to be able to pick up that information and probably use it to organise and control a nice little focused epoch of thought that is what we think of as being the core of being able to think intelligently. Are there many components? I mean, you've said that there's the kind of the frontal lobes and so on, but are there many regions dotted then around the brain that all come together in this way? There are probably four main sections which have different sorts of links. One is in the parietal lobe, which is much more a perceptual part of the brain. It has to do with representing the world around us. The frontal lobes are much more to do with action and the control of our behaviour. And then there are other systems which are more connected to bodily awareness and to emotion. And, of course, as you're progressing through a sequence of thought, there is a fairly strong bodily and emotional component to it as well. As you get the sense of satisfaction that something has been completed correctly, you can finish it and you should move on to the next thing. And certainly we think that those triggers of the sense of achievement are very important in guiding cognition through a series of steps. And how have you been able to identify them? So you mentioned the use of imaging. So is it the case where people will be doing various things and you'll image their brain activity at the same time? Yes, exactly. In fact, the simplest way, which works extremely well, is to take one of the standard tests to put people in a scanner solving those problems and to see which parts of the brain light up as that thinking goes on. But 
one of the things I said at the beginning that's most interesting about this general ability to do well is that the same people tend to tend to be doing well no matter what it is, whether it's doing a language test or a memory test or playing football. <laughs> and this same circuit then you see is a part of the brain's response to um, whatever task the person is currently undertaking, as you would hope for a general intelligence circuit. You mentioned that, I guess, as well as identifying the regions involved and this intelligent circuit, there's also, say, potential applications or greater understanding for when people are brain damaged or certain parts of their brain are damaged through, through injury or any other means. Yes. Uh, some of the most disabling changes that happen from brain damage do concern damage to this circuit. Of course, damage can be in different parts of the brain, and then you end up with different kinds of deficit, for example in the uh, region of the brain called the temporal lobe in the left hemisphere is sort of the seat of language and speech and that's where strokes give you the familiar picture of a person losing their ability to either understand or to speak. Uh, you could have damage which, in systems which have to do with spatial orientation to the world around you and then a person may end up behaving as if one side of space, for example, has completely vanished and they may eat just half the food on their plate or shave half of their face or put makeup on half of their face. Um, you may have damage that affects the visual system at the back of the brain and then a person can be rendered blind even though their eyes are absolutely fine. But in this core intelligence circuit, damage produces a much more widespread, very crippling, but hard to really characterise deficit. So that the person, no matter what they're doing, is just somewhat less organised than you would expect them to be in normal life. And so is it hoped then that a greater understanding of how all these regions kind of combine and the importance of certain ones over others can help be used to improve situations where somebody's brain is damaged? Or, is it, or how can it be applied, I guess, to help these situations? I mean, for brain damage, certainly, where there's a lot of work on trying to um, use our understanding of how the frontal lobes control our thoughts to train or rehabilitate people to get around the deficits that have been left with. For example, using prompts or cues left in their environment to remind them to do certain things at certain times. That's one of the people that, problems people can really have, for example, after head injuries. There's a lot of hope in using a similar understanding to try and ameliorate the cognitive declines you usually see in old age because, again, changes in this general intelligence circuit are one of the most salient things that happen to old people. My personal most optimistic idea would be about trying to get a handle on what we know is the large environmental influences on general intelligence in, in early childhood because it's very likely that, that uh, babies and young toddlers have a much more plastic and adaptable brain than old people whose brains are sadly decaying. And we know that a lot about early childhood is influencing how, how effectively this circuit and these processes operate. But we don't have a good understanding of what it is in a person's life that determines whether, uh, whether they grow up to use the system effectively. So that, I think, is in the medium to long term going to be the main place where we can really make a difference with this sort of understanding. So you could really use this understanding and this information to hopefully mould someone in a way that their intelligence would be greater when they grew up? Yeah, we know that this can happen. We just don't know how to make it happen. The average measured IQ of the population in all industrialised countries is going up. And very interestingly... The people at the higher end of the scale are not changing at all. It's a whole tale of people at the lower end of the scale who are gradually disappearing or are getting better and better and better. And the only sensible explanation for that is that life experiences, lifestyles that were common, say, in the 20s and 30s, simply aren't common anymore, that somehow people are getting stimulated to develop functions of this part, these parts of the brain better. And if only we knew what it was that was to causing that, then we might be able to make sure that everybody had the same opportunities. But at the moment, this is, this is still for the future. As well as improving, hopefully, human intelligence, you also mentioned the potential for artificial intelligence, so computers. The aspect of our own minds that we think of as being the most difficult intelligent reasoning things, computers have been extremely good at from very early years. The things that computers can't do well are the things that we do completely effortlessly, such as recognising a face or being able to 
organise the whole layout of the scene so that you know where you can walk, where you can't walk, what you mustn't run into and so on. The reason why it's very difficult to put a camera in a car and have a computer drive you around. So I think the main challenges for computer cognition, if you like, are not so much in the intelligence area at all. They're back in the area that the rest of us completely take for granted. John Duncan from the University of Cambridge. Whilst neuroscientists the world over are trying to reveal how intelligence happens, the majority of the population are craving such insight as well, as we saw by the many questions the audience had for John on the night of this cafe, starting with a query about the neurological basis of lying. But certainly, probably almost everything you can imagine has now been looked at with brain imaging methods to try and answer the question. It's not a field that I know very well, but I think you can just on common sense grounds realise there isn't going to be one solution to that problem because you're lying in so many different contexts for different reasons and by different mechanisms that they're all going to have rather different signatures. What there certainly are, one of the, to my mind, most surprising early results of the brain imaging enterprise was very focal areas of um, the frontal lobes, though not the part I was talking about in the temporal lobes, which have to do with thinking about other people's minds and what other people are currently trying to, uh, probably thinking and understanding. And it seems very likely that lying is going to be strongly dependent on that, along with the other systems that are, for example, imagining the alternative reality that you're about to present and so on. Lying is complicated, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a very straightforward solution. As scientists gain more and more insight into the workings of our mind, many members of the audience were keen to know how such insight could help improve someone's intelligence. Well, this is kind of a frustrating topic. We know from twin studies, and we know from every study that's ever been done, that though though there's a large genetic component to performance on general intelligence, as psychologists call it, and it's this genetic component that seems to attract everybody's attention, But you also know there's an equally large, roughly speaking, environmental component. And that alone tells you there is an answer to your question. There really are things that are happening in people's lives, probably mainly young children's lives, that are affecting how they develop the use of of, um, of these regions of the brain. And therefore, we could change people's experience so that the playing field became more level. The problem is that though that's been clear for, again, the, you know, the best part of a century, finding out what it is about people's experience that shapes the way their brain develops is still almost as elusive as it was 60 or 70 years ago. There is stuff out there to be found out. It's just that we haven't really found it yet. And what about the beginnings of this field, when very little was known about the workings of the brain? It seemed like a potentially infinite subject. There were people working on how people play chess, shall we say. How they write a story, in addition to how they recognize faces, how they construct a sentence and so on. And once you think, once there are psychology papers being written on how someone plays chess, you think, why not drafts? Why not cricket? You know, we can learn an infinite number of things. And if they're all equally legitimate subjects of inquiry, then you have this sense it's an all an unstructured mess. We don't really know what the important questions are. Whereas when it's all a great professor of psychology, Larry Weiskrantz, once said to me, the skull is a great container. Once you know everything has to fit into this particular set of brain systems and you can start to see what they're doing, then it gives you a sense that that it's controllable. You've got some sense of what the limits of the problem are through the medium of of components of the brain. And this has certainly very much helped, as I say, this sense that the field is finding its feet. But detailed studies of behavior that have been the essence of psychology for the last 100 years are just as important in, in, in contributing the understanding of what we actually care about, which is how we think and behave rather than what our neurons do. With a clear indication that intelligence can be improved upon during development with the right stimulation, some people were curious whether brain injuries can also heal better the younger you are. Uh, And again, that's very widely believed to be the case, and even though it's by no means night and day, I think probably the balance of the evidence suggests that it is. And again, it's sort of common sense. I mean, the brain is just a bit of your body like all the other bits. And, uh, you know, anything that you damage in a baby is going to recover a lot better than what you damage in a 90-year-old. And I'm sure this is true of the brain as well, which is why, you know, most of the evidence suggests that. If you have to be hit on the head, it's better to be young. But there are somewhat exaggerated claims about how 
as long as you get damage when you're very small, it doesn't really matter. That's totally false. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't go around damaging the brains of your children because it doesn't, it doesn't have any effect when they grow up. It just probably has less effect than it does in your granny. And the big question, is such intelligence really unique to us humans? It's obvious that the human mind can do things that no other animal is even close to being able to do. But I would find it very surprising indeed if the core abilities that make that true are not the same abilities that have been developing in, in other primates and that have just reached a quantitative rather than qualitative change to make us able to essentially construct plans of arbitrary length. So, you know, no other animal can, can plan through the whole sequence of operations that you can think of when you think, I'd like to go on a trip to France. And then pretty soon you're on the internet buying tickets and so on. So to, break, to construct a, pl a program of that length is something that is outside the ability of even the smartest apes. But on the other hand, the smartest apes' behavioral programs are much more long and elaborate than those of a cat or a dog, shall we say. And then the other thing that I think is critical, and again, I think is a part of the system that I'm talking about, Focus has essentially got to do with selective attention. It's being able to take a particular aspect of a situation and throw everything else away. And once you've got that down perfectly, you have essentially the abstraction machine. Because an abstraction is something where you take the, something critical about a whole set of situations and throw away all the differences between them. And abstraction, of course, again, is something that's very different from us, that we can form a goal not only to get to the door and walk out, but any form of goal we can imagine, we, we, can, um, we can express and then go through mental, mental operations that get there. So those two things, the complexity of the hot sequence that we can put together and the focus on just any arbitrary aspect of, of the information we're thinking about in the process of doing that are the two things that I think are really quite, quite special about the human mind. But I think difference in degree, not difference in kind from what many other animals do. John Duncan from the University of Cambridge. Now John's talk sparked a lot of interest in the audience as many of them stayed around to discuss the topic after the event, at which point I caught up with them to eavesdrop on their thoughts. It was very interesting. I had a stroke last September so I have a personal interest in what he was saying about brain recovery. So yes, very interesting and I would, I'd have liked to have known more but obviously it's a huge subject. Well, well, just, I guess, if you don't mind me asking, did anything change with your behaviour or your kind of thought processes after your stroke? Well, very definitely. I find I can't think of as many, nearly as many things as, at the same time. And what he was talking about focus is really interesting because if I've got one fixed idea in my head, I can concentrate on that, but it's very easy to be distracted. So, yeah, very relevant, very interesting. I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, and I was, I guess, a little surprised how much the subject was still in its infancy. But the thing that threw me, there was a lot that was uh, not very definite, because when you compare it to lots of other areas, obviously there's very exquisite spectroscopic techniques in chemistry, and we can know precisely what molecules are doing. Um, I was just really surprised that we are in, in the infancy. It was fascinating, yeah. I mean, it really answered um, some questions I didn't realise I had. I mean, I hadn't realised how young the kind of science they're, they're exploring is and the kind of, you know, newness of it all. Um, but specifically, I've got a child, and, you know, they mentioned um, the development of, of children and um, some of the things they said there was really interesting. I thought it was fascinating. I mean, I knew that the science was young, but to realise that, that they were actually kind of... that they're getting there, that he thinks that it's possible, that in a 50 years' time we might actually know some answers to these questions, that was brilliant. I just, I mean, any particular questions you're keen to know the answer to? Yeah, I think that the big, the big question, I think, like Pistemic Convention, is about development and how kids can, how, how we can actually alter these things and how we can you know, improve people's lives for better. <laughs> so most people were surprised but also excited about the infancy of this field of science and the possibilities it could provide in the future. Now, that's it for this month's podcast, but I'll be back next month with highlights from the next cafe. If you'd like to attend that event for yourself, details will soon be available online at cambridgecafescientifique.com. The Triple Helix Cambridge Café Scientifique is sponsored by the Medical Research Council. And this podcast was produced by me, Mira Senthilingam, from The Naked Scientists.